Thank you. Good, good afternoon. It's uh, very, very good to be with you. I'm very pleased to be here in Mexico City. As, as Bob Fryer said earlier, I want to say a very, very big thank you to all the guys from Palo Santo for making this possible because without them we wouldn't be here. And similarly, the guys from Digia, you know, Mike Spencer really didn't create Aspisk in the first place. We wouldn't be here either. So we need to uh, remember to be grateful to those people. Now, have you ever noticed that when you get your elastics out of the box, it's kind of set up for North America? North American tones, North American times, North American languages. So this talk is all about being able to change elastics or change asterisk to be local for your region. So whether your region is Mexico or whether your region is somewhere else or England or wherever, it's all about the changes you need to make. But before I start, I have a very important thing to share with you. Scientifically, it's been proven recently that people learn more if they have a moustache. Now, I don't know whether you've heard this. I mean, we've always known that facial hair was, uh, was something very special in the open source community, but recent research has told us that if you wear a moustache, you learn more. So in order to get you to learn more, I have the moustaches, okay? <laughs> the ladies are gonna pass these moustaches around, you're gonna wear them, and you're gonna learn more as a result. And at the end of the talk, there'll be an opportunity to have a group moustache photo up the front here. So ladies, if you can pass those. Anybody who wants to wear a moustache is welcome to wear one. There's a few different ones. Even better if it's not your colour. You know, if you've got black hair and a brown moustache, that's so much better. Anyway, so what we want to do is we want to take this American asterisk and we want to localise it for use in our geography. And so what we're going to do in order to do that is we're going to ask what kind of things might we need to change in order to localise our asterisk. Then when we've established what it is that we need to change, we'll say, well, where do we go and change that stuff? How do we make it possible? And how can we change it? So it's all very well knowing which file to go into, but we've got to know what to type in that file to make it happen. But first of all, a quick test. I know that uh, you've been here a long time, all day, but this is the last talk just before we finish for the evening, and I thought I'd help you get to know each other just a little bit more. So I want you to do a test with me. It's a very special test. It's a personality test. We have to put your hands together like this. Can you all do this for me for a moment? Just all put your hands together. Just clasp them. Okay. By the way, somebody asked me whose hands those were that I used for the photo, and the answer is they're Alison's hands. She let me take a photo of them. Okay. So you've all you put your hands together like that, and you'll notice that either your left thumb or your right thumb is on top. Okay, you'll notice that. So, keep them together. Who's got the left thumb on top? Everybody who's got the left thumb, just put your hand up. Keep it up, take a good look around the room at all the left thumb people. Look at them all. Because do you know what? They are the sexy people in the audience. Okay, keep an eye on that. Keep an eye on that right there. Now, okay, who's got the right thumb? Who's got the right thumb? Keep, keep those hands up. Take a good look at those people because they think they're the sexy people. <laughs> Fortunately, this talk doesn't find you both groups of people. Anyway, a little bit about me. So my name's David Duffield. I'm a chartered engineer from the United Kingdom. I've been in telecommunications for more than 20 years. So back in the days before there was SIP, when we were talking about ISDN protocols and stuff like that and analog devices, I was doing that. But I always secretly believed that telecoms could be fun. Before Asterisk ever existed, I've got old Panasonic PBXs in my house so I could bring from the kitchen to the bedroom and bring down to the kitchen and ask my wife to make me a drink and then she'd return my call and say, make it yourself, that kind of stuff. Um, my background is very much in comms, originally in the Civil Aviation Authority, air ground communications, so mission critical stuff, but also wireless local loop and computer telephony. But, what I've done has always in some way been connected with training. There's always been a training thread there, and I'm a qualified trainer, so I've trained to be a trainer as well as to be an engineer. And as the, the lady mentioned, the O'Reilly book, um, the latest one, The Definitive Guide, I'm not an author of that book, but the three authors of, of the guys you've heard of, but I contributed a single chapter, chapter number nine, about internationalization, and that's our subject for today. But about Telespeak, very quickly, we've been going since 2006. We're located in the um, UK, near Oxford. The whole business is asterisk-focused. 
mainly training and consultancy. We're an Elastics training partner. We're about to run the very first Elastic, Elastic Certified Engineer course in the UK very, very soon. We're also a Digium Authorised Training Partner as well, and we do Zorcom and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, to the job in hand, we've got to localise. By the way, I do want this to be a highly participative thing. I want you to be answering questions and putting your hands up. So, is there anybody in the audience that doesn't like putting their hands up? No, okay, in that case, we can move on. So, what might we need to change? So, I want you to tell me, if you've got the elastics and you want to put it into Mexico, but you've just downloaded it from the website, what might, what things might you need to change about it? Any, any ideas there? I beg your The wave bus, who said that? That man over there. Can, can we give that man an English chocolate? Everybody who answers a question gets a free English chocolate. <laughs> that man right over there. <laughs> yes, so the wave files, in other words, the prompts, the language of the prompt, or maybe sometimes it's just the accent of the prompt. Because, of course, in England, for example, we speak English, like they do in America, but we have a slightly different accent, and people like to hear their, their local accent. So that's one answer. So the languages of the prompts. Any other answers? Yes, sir? Which language? The GUI language. Yes, go ahead. Well done, that man. Yes, sir? The dial tone. Very important one. Have you ever noticed how unsettling it is if you pick up a telephone and it doesn't sound the way you want it to sound? You know, if you don't get your native dial tone, it could ruin your weekend. So you, you really want to have the proper dial tone. Any other answers? Got a couple right at the back there. Bob's right at the back. Subject, verb, object. Sorry? The order of subject, verb, and object. Oh, okay, the, the orders of things. I am going to handle the orders of things, but I'm going to be talking about dates, because Americans like the month first, then the date. Some Europeans like the date first and then the month, so we'll be talking about that kind of stuff. What was your thought? Time zones. Time zones, another good one. Can you make sure Bob gets an English chocolate there for time zones? I'm not sure that everybody who's taking a chocolate has actually answered the question, but we'll have to investigate that later. Okay, yes, yeah, so thank you very much for those. So the ones that I've thought of were system prompts, the languages. Caller ID, nobody mentioned caller ID, did they? But caller ID shows up, did you get your chocolate bottle? Good, okay. Caller ID shows up in different formats in different countries, doesn't it? If I was to buy a phone in Mexico here and take it back to the UK, an analog phone, and plug it in, it would probably work as a phone, but it probably wouldn't display caller ID. So we need to change that. Then there's the tones, when you pick up the phone, hearing the correct tones. But it's not just hearing the correct tones, if Asterisk is going to um, be connected to an analog phone, Asterisk needs to generate the tones, but if Asterisk is going to make a call to an analog line, Asterisk has to understand the tones as well, doesn't it? So it's both the generation of the tones and the recognition of the tones. What about the actual telephony interfaces? Again, if I was to buy a phone here and take it home to plug in England, it would be a different plug on the end. So we have to, now, that might sound like something very, very trivial, but if you were to buy a Digium card, it would have an RJ45 connector, wouldn't it, on one end? That's where you plug the line into the RJ45 connector. It's great to see some people wearing this office in the audience, lovely. And what you'd find is you've got to supply the lead to plug that into the phone socket. Now, all these leads are not created equal. Some will work and some won't. It can be a subject of great uh, trouble for people when they've got the wrong lead. And lastly, times and dates, time zones and date zones. As we all know, Asterisk and Elastics is wonderful in that it can serve different extensions in different zones. And so we need to be on top of that. Great, okay, so let's start with the tones. Let's flex our changing muscles and start with the tones. So the first thing, well, the first thing is IP devices. So if we're talking about an IP phone, like a SIP phone, or if we're talking about an analog telephony adapter, we're going to have to change those tones. Um, tones on the analog channels, if we're going to plug phones into it. And not only that, but how about a call that gets into asterisk already? So you're in asterisk, and then you go to do a transfer. It hears some tones from inside asterisk, doesn't it? So we, we need to change those too. So where do we change them? Well, it's very simple. On the IP devices, who, hands up who knows that IP devices are very clever, aren't they? Very clever devices. If you get two old-fashioned analog phones and you plug them together, could you make a call between them? No, you couldn't, because they're dumb devices. 
They're dumb devices, they're very cheap devices that have to connect to a very expensive intelligent network called the PSTN. And it's the PSTN that gives them the power, the ringtone, the signaling. If I was to go outside to the exhibition floor there and take two SIP phones and just connect them together, because you know, SIP phones these days actually have a switch in, don't they? So let's say I take an Ethernet patch cord and I connect two SIP phones together, could I make a call from one SIP phone to the other? Of course I could, couldn't I? Because those SIP phones have got the stack inside them. As long as you've allocated IP addresses, you could actually dial 192, 168, whatever, and make a call. So, because these devices are so clever, that's exactly where we have to alter the tone, isn't it? On the device itself. It's no good going into asterisk, going into indications.com, and thinking, I'm going to change the dial tone for my Yaling phone. That's not going to work, is it? The tones have to be changed on the device themselves. Incidentally, of course, so for dial plans, because phones themselves have a dial plan that needs to be changed. So, whether it's a SIP phone or an ATA, you must go into the user interface of that device in order to change it. Now, analog channels. We're going to plug a phone into an FXS port. We're going to have to do that somewhere. That would be in etc Derby system .com. So, you guys that have used the elastics, you've got a hardware detector, haven't you? You go in there, do the hardware detector, and it generates new files for you. But I'll, I expect what you'll find at the moment is when it generates those new files, it defaults to the US for the, for the tones it's going to provide. So if you wanted to give it a different dial tone, you'd manually have to go in there into etcdarbysystem.com and change something. So we'll look at that soon. In fact, it would be load zone. So you're going to have to load the zone for the tones and also the default zone. Now in Asterisk, or, or in Derby I should say, you can load many zones. So you can load French tones, the Spanish tones, the German tones, but you must default to one set of tones. And you can change on the fly, so you can change those tones. What about the internal tones, the ones inside Asterisk? So once the calls inside Asterisk and you make a transfer, for instance on an analog phone and hear the, hear the tone, where are we going to do those? Anybody know? Sorry? Somebody said indications.com. Where are those English chocolates? Now, the with the English chocolates. Indications.com. Would be etc asterisk indications.com. And it's not a very complicated file to work out. You go in there and it says country equals US. And you just look down the list of countries that are in that file and change it to the one you want. Okay, there you go. Country, I would change it to country equals UK. Um, you may change it to country equals ES if you want the Spanish dial tones. For example. <coughs> okay, so where exactly are these files? Well, of course, one of the wonderful things about Elastics is it gives us that very useful user interface, doesn't it? We can just browse in and change things. But in order to do some of these changes, at least at the moment, maybe in future revisions of Elastics, you'll be able to choose languages and things like that. But at the moment, you might have to go into a file system. So we'd be going into, let me get my laser pointer, we'd be going into etc asterisk and then indications.com in that particular case. Okay, time and date localization. So asterisk can be made aware of many different time zones, but in fact, it's a little bit confusing at first because in asterisk, a zone is not a time zone. A zone is a way of describing a place that includes the time zone, but it also includes other things. Because in some countries, I like to hear the time, let's, let's take Europe, people would want 3 o'clock in the afternoon to be 1,500 hours. But if you go to America, they would want to hear 3 p.m., right? So there's a slightly different thing. So it's not, not just the actual time, but it's the way the time is announced. Right down to whether a zero is said or an O, O or zero. Um, so we need to cater for all of those things in asterisk. So it would be mainly down to voicemail. When you think about time zones, and you start, you know, you know what it's like. You're laying in bed thinking about asterisk. And you start thinking about the time zones. When you, when you really consider it, it really, the rubber only really hits the road as far as announcements and things. It's an invoice map. Not very many other places. Of course, we've got time of day routing, which will need the time zone to be correct. But in terms of the actual messages that you're hearing, the time stamp for voice map, it's all in voice map. And you know that special asterisk recipe that when you want to configure something, you just go into the etc asterisk subdirectory, 
you think about what it is you want to configure, and you add .conf on the end, don't you? So if it's voicemail, you go to voicemail.conf. And so if we look inside voicemail.conf, we've got a few different things. First of all, we've got a section called zone messages. And zone messages is where we set zones. Now remember what I said, that a zone is not a time zone, but it includes a time zone. So here, I'm saying the zone, the time zone for central is the America Chicago time zone, but I'm also setting a few other things right down to the way the time and date are pronounced. Same for the UK here. And when I describe the mailboxes in the default section of voicemail.com, if that's where I'm going to do it, because it might be device as well, um, I describe it and at the end I, I say that the zone equals UK. The zone equals UK, which means it's on the London time zone and all these other settings apply. Similarly, this mailbox is in the zone of central. Central's on the Chicago time zone and all those settings apply. So that's where we would localize the voicemail settings and therefore the time. Okay, what about changing the language of the prompt? Somebody mentioned that. Now, by default, Asterisk stores all of its prompts in ETC. Um, I don't know if my line says. It stores them in bar, lib, asterisk, sounds, and then in another subdirectory, that's Miss Scotch over there, by the way, so very nice, very nice that one. Um, I'm not seeing any ladies from Miss Scotch, just Ah, excellent, top class. Okay, we'll get those on the photos later. So, it's in bar, lib, asterisk, sounds, and then usually a two digit subdirectory to denote which language. So, EN for English, ES for Spanish, and so on. <coughs> And let's have a little look at it. So, what we've got is we can have these subdirectories, but we need to use Asterisk's own naming conventions. So, for instance, if we're telling Asterisk to play the hello prompt, then if we specify Violet Sounds Asterisk EM, hello will actually contain the word hello. However, if we specify the Spanish one, hello.gsm would be the file picked up, but it would actually say hola. And that's how we can internationalize the language, or indeed, the accent of the language in asterisk. Now, it's all very well kind of putting those, those uh, sounds in, but how do we choose which set of sounds we're going to do? Well, we can do it in a few different ways. We can set it in the channel. So we can say, if a certain SIP device comes in, we're going to give it this language. Or if a certain EAT device comes in. So for example, we can go into SIP.com. If it was eats, it would be eats.com. If it was for an analog device, it would be in chandadi.com. Or, of course, if you're using the rather wonderful Elastic's hardware detection, which is underneath relying on Darby Genconf to do that, then it would probably be appropriate to put in darbychannels.com. And here's a couple of examples. So in sip.com, I'm saying that my default language is Spanish. So all the SIP devices that come in to Asterisk will be greeted in the Spanish language. Unless it's my phone, DD phone, because I like French. Actually, it's a lot. I don't really like French at all. But just for purposes of this example, I've popped it in there. Okay. So all, you know, Spanish is the general, French is the special in this particular case. And so when I go to play that hello, if I come in as a general SIP device, I will hear um, all that. But if I come in from this phone, I'll hear bonjour. So you can see that we can do that. Now, we can also do it in the dial plane. And this is something that's changed over the evolution of asterisk. It used to be a channel variable called language, but it's now part of a channel function called channel, which describes lots of attributes of the channel. And the particular one we're interested in is called, where is it? Language. There it is, just there. So channel is the function, language is the parameter. So let's just take a look at a phone call coming in to the language menu. First of all, we do a background, choose language, and that would be a prompt. So which language do you want? One for uh, French, two for German, three for Spanish. Then once, once they put it in, you can see I'm setting the language parameter of the channel function to either be French, German, or Spanish. And then I'm saying my next priority is to go off to that extension 6001, so they would hear their language of choice. So this is something that's relatively easy to do. And I know I was speaking to Bob earlier, and I know that there's ways that this is being integrated slowly 
into uh, free PBX and ultimately into Elastic. But at the moment, there still is facility to go under the hood, onto the command line, and into these files to change things. What about Core ID then? So Core ID comes in lots of different flavors. Over in the UK, we use a format called B23, which is frequency shift key. And the tone is actually coming between the rings. So if you could listen to a, an incoming phone call before you picked it up, you'd hear ring, ring, bit of a, do you want me to do that again? No, all right, I'll move on. Um, so it's frequency shift key. An asterisk can be made not only to understand different types of core ID signaling, but just as importantly, to give out different types of core ID signaling. Because it's all very well understanding what a caller ID is coming in on an analog line. But if I want to give it out to a phone, I also need to be able to send that format of caller ID. And in the, in the case of the UK, let me show you an example. In the case of the UK, we actually send the caller ID after the second ring. And you can even go into asterisk and say you are to send the caller ID after the second ring. It's very, very clever. So there's a standard British telecom phone. And with the addition of these three lines, into my dardychannels.com, I can say, yes, I want to use the V23 signaling system. The way I indicate the start of caller ID coming down the line is by polarity reversal of the telephone line. And I'm going to send it after the second ring. And the only other thing I've got on an analog line coming in, caller ID equals <coughs> received. That just means propagate the caller ID through the system. Good. Any questions so far? Okay. That was an opportunity to get a free chocolate then. <laughs> so, let's carry on. What about the physical characteristics of our telephone line? Well, that's a BT plug. <coughs> you probably don't use it over here. You might just use a standard RJ45. And this lead is very, very important. And I'll tell you why this lead is very, very important. If you've just got an RJ, um, RJ11, one of these, if you've got one of those at both ends, it's fine. Everything's probably going to be all right. But if you've got this at one end and your local plug at another, do you know what the temptation is? The temptation is to think that any lead you find in an old drawer that's got the right plug on each end is going to work. But you know what it's like, and some of these leads date back to 28.8 dial-up modems made in some rather strange places in the world, and they're not necessarily going to have the right connections inside them, and this has caught a number of people out. So they'll ring up and they'll want a support request because their analog line is not working. And yet actually, it's just the lead between the wall, their incoming line, and the Digium code. So something very much to consider. Also, of course, the voltages as well. Different parts of the world use different voltages for their telephony signaling. Then, of course, um, we've got the way that the stuff is transmitted here over to the local exchange and the signaling that's given. Um, and we have the three choices there, we, we have our loop start, cool start, and ground start. Yes, I, I won't go into detail in those, but again, that's something you can set locally, so it's going to work for you. Cool start is the one that you would prefer if it's available. Now, nasty subject, echo. Echo. That was an obvious joke, but I thought I'd throw it in. So, on this um, picture of an analog phone here, I've got a speaker to listen to people. I've got a microphone to talk, but I've only actually got two wires on my telephone book, haven't I? And so I've got this device called a hybrid, which does the two to four wire conversion. And the problem is that the impedance that it has is not always the same as the impedance of the telephone book. And when those two are not equal, all of the energy rushes up to the telephone oh, sorry, rushes, rushes up to the telephone line. And it can't get in, it gets rejected, and then it flows back down the line and it shows up as an echo on the line. And so that's a very nasty thing that we have to be aware of. Now, that's not really an internationalization issue, but I thought I'd pick up on it. The best thing to do is to make sure you get some hardware echo cancellation on the case somewhere. And there's a range of ditches and guards that do all that, but have all the echo cancellation rules. That is the echo cancellation module uh, just there. Okay, basic rates. Does anybody use basic rate or BRI, ISDN2? Not in Mexico. In that case, we'll move on. Who was the lady who said not in Mexico? Can we give that not in Mexico lady a chocolate, please? We don't want anybody to go with that. Okay, so we don't really need to talk about that. But we do use primary rate. And it's T1 here. Is that correct? 
the T1 is the, the preferred for the, the main um, PRI. So, we've got to know what interface we've got. It's all very well known to PRI, but we need to ask ourselves, is it the Robbit protocol or some old cast based protocol, or are we talking about an ISDM protocol, be it NI2 or AT&T or whatever it is. So we need to know that. That's a localization issue, and hopefully you can get that information from your telephone company and configure your uh, Digium card or other interface accordingly. Of course, in Europe, uh, things are a little bit simpler um, because we only have the one thing. There's not uh, any case of robbed pit here, so we always have 30 voice channels on a PRI. There are some older cast based protocols in Europe, but, but not so many. In Mexico, you're using cast based protocols. What, R2 signaling? R2, I'm a big R2 fan. Some of my best friends have used R2 signaling. That's great. Yes, and of course, um, Asterisk is well capable of R2 signaling, as you know. Okay, now, protocols. There's lots of different protocols. And one of the problems about protocols is all over the world, people use different names for different protocols, but occasionally they use different names for the same protocol. And you have to kind of get to the bottom of that. So when somebody says, I'm using R2, MFC, HH493, ear and mouth, you need to kind of dig a little bit deeper and find out exactly what they are. Sometimes it's a case of getting a protocol trace from them and seeing what it looks like, because sometimes that might lead you to find actually the standard R2 signal or something like that. So it's good to know the protocols and good to find out about them. And if you go on the internet, there's always lots of resources about which countries use which protocols. And again, there's Digium cards there for various different protocols uh, you can use. Then there's the physical termination. So if you're using R2 signaling here, is it always RJ45s, or is it occasionally the push and twist, the BNC? It is sometimes the BNC. BNC. Wouldn't it be frustrating if you got to the site where you're going to install your telephone system with a Digium card without any changing apparatus. And you've got two BNCs in your hand and an RJ45 on the Digium card. So you need these kind of things, don't you? You need the balance uh, to do the balanced to unbalanced thing. And of course, you need to get transmit and receive the right way round. If you don't do that, you'll be in for a rather annoying day. Uh, so having that kind of physical connectorization option is something that's very, very important. And of course, making sure your cars that you're going to use do have the relevant approvals because telecoms authorities can get rather, rather nasty about those kind of things. Now, that's all I have to say. I, I'm going to recap after this, but before I recap, I welcome any questions that you might have on the subject of internationalization. And there's one right at the back. Right at the back. Hi there. Hello, Hello. Gentlemen from Panama. When I when I said subject verb object before, what I meant was, for example, in English you say you have one new message. Ah, in okay. Spanish you say one you have one message new. Right. So also the subject verb object adjective. I'm word. with you now. Yes, oh. absolutely. That's a very. Can we give that man a chocolate, please? It's a very good case, and of course it can be handled, but it would. I believe it has to be handled manually. I don't know that there's anything already in there to do that. Care to comment? Yeah, that, that voicemail is not very flexible. There's a mini voicemail application that has a bit more flexibility for those. Um, so app voicemail is really not all that flexible. There's a mini voicemail application that has a bit more flexibility for those sorts of things. Uh, so you may want to make use of that or at least look into it. Yes, and I, I think those applications are called mini VM. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, so look for mini VM if you'd like to change that. Okay, any other questions? Yes, sir. Yes, I want to know how you handle it with the, the European community and UK, because I understand that UK is uh, outside the European community. Yes, so what, what, really do you, like what, what do you do with it? You have the different protocol that you, you are um, in some way? Okay, yes, so, no, well, let, let's talk about PRI first. So in the UK, we use Euro ISDN on a standard E1. And actually, that's the same pretty much as the rest of the world, other than North and South America and Japan. 
Japan uses the J one, North America, South America use the T one, but pretty much most of the rest of the parts of the world, I'll do a random sampling of Bob rather than that. E one, Euro ISDN Bob? Yep. Exactly. If you were to go to Seoul in Korea, it's Euro ISDN, and in the UK it is also Euro ISDN. There is a however there, and the however is that very, very occasionally you run into a thing that looks like a Euro ISDN but it's a very old BT protocol called DAS2, the Digital Automatic Signaling System, which is a CAS-based protocol, and it's not one that Asterisk or any of the associated adapters can use. So the magic rule here is you can do one of two things. You can either pay a very, very large amount of money for a gateway, or you can ring up BT and say, change the protocol, please, and they make a charge of about 300 pounds to change that protocol. In terms of analog signaling, we're the same as everywhere else, other than the presentation of Core ID. Does that answer your question, sir? Yeah, yeah. Good, OK, thank you. Did that man get a chocolate for answering your question? He did. There's another one right at the back there. Okay. These are good chocolates. <laughs> Anyways, my next question um, would be, we have touched on documentation, both on the PDF side as a provider, if you need to provide documentation of what you install. You have to take localization into account because sometimes when you have multi-tenant systems, yes. you have to provide uh, documentation in several languages. And also, from you guys, like did you on the hardware and the, the software side, you also need to provide documentation in different languages. What kind of efforts have you made in that sense uh, to help people with both sides of that equation? A very good question and, and agreed on both things. So let's handle the user documentation issue first. I would see that. Did you get chocolate, by the way? Oh, sorry, I, need chocolate. I think that lady is secretly trying not to give out the chocolate so that she and the other ladies can eat the chocolate to make sure wrong. It's just a theory. It's just a theory. Anyway, let's answer your question. So, the first part, user documentation, I see that as part of the value add that you would provide since you're setting up asterisk or elastics for your user. You're doing all the configuration and the documentation is perhaps something that you can provide. Of course, there are excellent helps out there like Elastics Without Tears and various other things that you can use. I totally agree that all providers of things like hardware, Digim included, should work hard to make documentation and support available in those different languages. It tends to be done on a commercial basis. In other words, wherever the biggest market is, and I think I'm right in saying that Digium would have Spanish support. Is that right? If not For certain the products. Uh, the support, yes, the support staff uh, does include the Spanish speaking native. Um, the documentation, however, for the user handles for the products are still inside the English. How can we help? How can you help? Well, that's, there you go. Uh, if you want to help specifically with translations for product documentation, contact our marketing. Sorry, I just want to stand up. Uh, contact our marketing department. Uh, if you want to help with asterisk translation, um, then contact uh, some of the maintainers of the asterisk project. Uh, you can get in touch with me uh, or contact with anybody else on the uh, development team, or you can just simply send an email to uh, asteriskteam at digium.com. That'll go meet several of you. This is the great community thing, isn't it? That we can help. Um, do. So I'm perhaps going to do a module of appeals, costly rhyming slash into my stress for people, but that's another project. Any other questions? We've got time for just one or two more questions. Oh, one more. Sorry, I lied. We only have to, so it's one more chance for a question and one more chance for a chocolate. Anybody going to take that chance? In that case, I'm in a position. Yeah, my, my mustache is slightly real. I know it doesn't look real. You see, I've, I discovered a long time ago that you can have more influence in open source if you've got facial hair. But unfortunately, my facial hair just doesn't grow as well as it should. I'm going to finish off now. So, just to recap the presentation, what we might we want to change? Well, we said we want to change the tones, we want to change the language, we want to change the um, way that things are announced, the order of things, and we also want to change the core ID and all that kind of stuff. Where can we change it? Well, it boils down to, if it's an IP device, an intelligent device, like a SIP phone, or an analog telephone adapter, it's going to be on the device itself. So you're going to need to go into the web interface for that daily phone, like Polycom phone, or that Linksys ATA, or whatever it might be, and change the stuff in there. Um, if it's inside Dardy, because we're plugging something into a Digium card, 
but it's going to be etcdardysystem.com and etc asterisk either chandardy.com or if you've used Dardy Gencon, it's going to be the Dardy Channels.com. And just a quick thing, I mentioned the O'Reilly book, um, Asterisk the Definitive Guide. You can buy it, but it's usually available online. And this is just, oh, sorry, can, you, can we cut over to the screen for a minute, please? Can we, can we get that on the Yes, sorry, let me just go, yeah, so I did the recap. This, this, little, this is a table of what to change and where to change it, and it's taken straight out of the O'Reilly book from chapter nine, but you can go and find this online, so there's a little resource, and I put the website there, I don't expect you to write it down, but you can get hold of the presentation afterwards and go through to that link. Okay, and I'd like to conclude the presentation by hoping that all of your Elastics deployments will feel at home. Thank you very much. Thank you.